News of the Times Serial Killer Saturdays Mary May Death Club Killer Mastermind Today's episode takes place in 1848 in Colchester, England, with Victorian housewife Mary May. One's chances of staying alive if one was related to Mary May were poor. Statistically, she worked her way through all her family members and then helped her sister, Hannah Southgate, to murder her husband as well. Mary then also inspired a wider group of female friends to kill inconvenient husbands and children. No one was safe across four parishes. As we find regularly in our Serial Killer Saturdays, it is one murder which then unravels a series of previous murders. This case from Colchester was so famous at the time it was discussed in Parliament and the Home Secretary became involved. This case and the following up case of the sister's poisoning of her husband as well as several other cases in Essex, was believed by authorities to be a poisoning ring. The coroner's office worked diligently for five years, tracking down the murders to the respective killers. The concern was that unhappy Victorian wives were regularly killing off their husbands and inconvenient children, by poison at least. In Essex. This episode focuses solely on Mary May, who was clearly the most famous of the Essex killers as she worked her way through a surmised kill count of 16. We hope you enjoy the show. Mary May, aged 38, proven kills 1, suspected kills 16, knowing aided killing. One. About Mary May. Mary May lived in the village of Wicks, a small village located just outside of Harwich in the north east of Essex. Mary was 38 years old and married to her second husband. With them was her 10 year old son Robert from her first marriage and a 2 year old son from her current husband. Mary and her husband made their living by selling bread and other food items, and also by housing lodgers. The two lodgers were Mary's half-brother, known as Spratty Williams, but referred to as W. Constable in news reports. The other lodger was a James Simpson. It seemed her brother tended to his own needs whilst lodging there, but would normally eat dinner with his sister. He had been lodging with Mary and her husband for approximately two years. Reportedly, they got on well. Burial Club, colloquially known as Death Clubs. In Victorian times, funerals and burials were very expensive. These types of insurance schemes were independently run. The idea being you put in a small amount per week and upon death would receive a payout that could be used for the funeral with a little bit left over. You could enrol another person into the death club without their knowledge and with a few simple questions to be answered. The payout amount was dependent on the number of members in the club. In this case, the expected payout was between nine and ten pounds, worth approximately fifteen hundred pounds in 2023. The crime. Mary's half-brother, referred formerly as William Constable, was 48 years of age and with no reported history of ill health, was placed in a death club by Mary. On the 8th of June, shortly after a normal meal with Mary, her brother is stated to have begun violently retching with a reported burning sensation in his throat and stomach. 
He is sick throughout the night and all through Friday. On Saturday, a doctor is called for who finds William in a great state of exhaustion. A brother dies. From the Weekly Chronicle on the 15th of July, 1848. Atrocious murder by poisoning for burial fees. Suspicious death of 14 children. For several days past, Mr. Codd, the coroner, has been pursuing a most searching investigation into the whole of the facts, and at ten o'clock on Friday night, the inquiry terminated in a verdict of willful murder against a woman named Mary May for feloniously administering arsenic to her brother, the deceased, and thereby causing his death. The subjoined facts, as collected from the coroner's deposition, briefly details the whole particulars connected with the dreadful affair. In the parish of Wicks, a small village on the high road to Harwich, about six miles from the Manning Tree Station of the East Union Railway, lived the deceased, William Constable, alias Spratty Watts. He had not been married. He maintained himself by selling trifling things about the country, and for comfort's sake lodged in the house of his sister, Mary May, a married woman. He appears to have prepared his own meals except tea, which he was in the habit of taking with his sister. On the eighth inst, he returned to his lodgings in good health, and had tea as usual. Shortly afterwards, William Constable was attacked with violent retching and burning pains in his throat and stomach. These symptoms continued until the following Sunday when he died. The moment he was attacked, the sister called in several neighbours to see him. He assured them that it was almost certain that he would die, but... Strange to remark, no suspicion was excited that anything had been administered to him. On the declaration of the sister that death had resulted from natural decline, the body was interred in the parish churchyard. She, the sister Mary May, officiated as chief mourner. In the course of a few days, she, Mary May, called on the Reverend G. Wilkins, the incumbent, for the purpose, as she explained, of obtaining a certificate from the Reverend gentleman that deceased was in good health a fortnight before his death, and that he was in his thirty-eighth year, forty-eight was his real age, and he was not married. This Reverend Wilkins declined doing, inquiring of her what she wanted it for. She, Mary May, replied that she had, had entered the deceased, her brother, in a burial club at Harwich a fortnight before his death, and that the society would not pay the money allowed for the interment of the deceased unless they had a certificate of his good health at the time he was entered. The Reverend Wilkins told her that the money did not belong to her. Mary May said no one else was entitled to it, as she had done it all herself, and nobody else knew anything about it. These and other suspicious circumstances, particularly the number of children she had buried, coupled with the auspicious death of her former husband and the hasty and earnest solicitation she made in this instance, to obtain the fees from the burial society, induced the coroner of the district to direct the exhumation of the body. This being done, the stomach and contents were forwarded to a Mr. Taylor, the eminent professor of chemistry at Guy's Hospital, for analysis. The inquest was opened at the Wagon Public House at Wicks, and very conclusive evidence was adduced. The secretary of the burial society in question, John Pratt of Harwich, said it was designated 
the New Mariners Society and paid between nine and ten pounds on the death of a member, the sum depending on the number of members in the family. On the 13th of last May, the female, Mary May, accompanied by the schoolmistress of Wick's school, called at the office and inquired if the club was full. Being told that it had some vacancies, she said she wished to enter her brother in the club. He was a healthy man, and she had never known him to have a day's illness in his life, and that he was only thirty-five years of age. The secretary then entered the deceased's name, and she paid the fee, one shilling and threepence, for entering and four pence in advance. On the 6th of June, the school mistress brought two shillings for the payments due, and he, the secretary, heard no more of the party till the 11th of June, Sunday, when a man brought a note signed by Mrs. May stating that Constable had just died from strong inflammation and that the schoolmistress had seen him a short time previous. It was known that the deceased was in good health up to the time of partaking of the poisoned victuals on the evening of the 8th, and in contradiction, of course, to the instructions the sister had given to the registrar relative to the cause of death, she having stated it to be decline, duration of sickness, three months. A man named Simpson, who lived in the same house as the deceased, said that two days before his death, Mrs. May told him that she had entered her brother in a burial club and counted on getting his burial money ten pounds, which would set her up in business. She intended to buy a horse and cart and go about the country higgling. For our listeners, higgling was a colloquial term for goods trading of buying and selling. Mr. Professor Taylor, FRS lecturer on medical jurisprudence and chemistry at Guy's Hospital, in an elaborate report on the analysis, stated that arsenic was present in the contents of the stomach, that the quantity was sufficient to destroy two grown-up persons, and that it was taken during his life in the form of a powder, and that it caused death. Other circumstantial evidence being adduced showing an attempt on the part of Mrs. May to tamper with the principal witnesses and urging them not to disclose all they knew and the jury returned a verdict of willful murder against the sister, Mary May, and she was accordingly committed to the county jail at Chelmsford for trial at the next assizes. For our listeners, the tampering referred to was Mary May's offer of sexual favours with the jailer if he would let her go. The prisoner is a woman of most forbidding aspect and throughout the whole of the early part of the proceedings evinced the utmost indifference to the evidence of the surgeon when they disclosed the discovery. She had been married twice and had sixteen children, all of whom, with the exception of one, have died under considerable suspicion. The exhumation is expected to appease the excitement in the district. The trial and evidence. The evidence against Mary May was circumstantial but damning. Her brother had indeed become violently ill shortly after eating tea with Mary, food that she had cooked. Her ten-year-old son was called to give evidence. He reported having seen her take something from a paper which she put into the porter and after having boiled it, handed it to her brother, although he did not see him drink it. His additional evidence was that the powder was in a white colour, and I have heard Mother call it soda. She had put it into the beer many times before. 
10 grams of arsenic was found in William's stomach in the post-mortem, enough to kill two men. Mary had placed her brother in the burial club approximately a fortnight before, lying about his age and her age. Neither her brother nor her husband were aware of this. Mary had attempted to retrieve the insurance money very quickly after her brother's death, giving false information as to the cause of his death. Mary was known to have gone to the chemist to purchase arsenic. Whether she had actually purchased the arsenic was not recalled. Lastly, the other lodger, James Simpson, who shared a room with William, stated that Mary had told him about her brother's membership in the death club at the time of William's illness. He reported her as having expressed her wish for God to take him, her brother, away, so she could bury him respectably and get a donkey and a cart. The defence gave an impassioned plea focusing on the circumstantial nature of the evidence. No one had seen her actually poison her brother, and no trace of arsenic could be found in the house. The jury took twenty minutes to find her guilty. The judge, in his sentencing, exhorted Mary to make use of the short time that may remain to you to make your peace with God that you have offended. Mary May stuck to her plea of innocence. I did not do it. I am innocent. Strenuous attempts were made to commute her death penalty to penal servitude. This failed, partly due to the now suspected string of murders laid on her shoulders. From the Morning Advertiser, the 16th of August, 1848. The Execution of Mary May This morning at nine o'clock, Mary May, who was condemned to death by the Lord Chief Baron at the late Essex Assizes, for poisoning her brother, William Constable, alias Watts, underwent the extreme sentence of the law on a scaffold erected over the entrance of the county jail at Springfield. It may be remembered that her object in committing the fiendish act was the obtainment of a few pounds from a burial society at Harwich, of which she had made her unfortunate relative a member unknown to him. Respecting the evil tendency of these death societies, we may give the following extract of the learned Baron's address in condemning her. His lordship said, And I must hers denounce as exceedingly mischievous any association that could give you an interest in his death without his knowing anything about it and furnish you with the wicked and base getting rid of him, that you might obtain a small sum. It has already been known that most energetic measures were taken in several towns in the county, especially among the Society of Friends, to induce the court to spare her life, and a deputation with that object in view, headed by Sir E. N. Buxton Bart, who recently had an interview with the Secretary of State on the subject. Sir O. Gray, however, replied that no mitigatory circumstances had transpired in her case to warrant his recommending her to the mercy of the sovereign. For several days after her fate had been declared, she displayed great sullenness and apparent obstinacy of temper, but throughout the earnest exhortations of the chaplain, the Reverend Mr. Hamilton, she was brought to a state more befitting an awful position. On the Saturday evening she was removed from the old jail, the female's prison, in the centre of the town to that at Springfield, where she had to undergo the dreadful sentence. In the course of yesterday, Sunday, she seemed 
in great mental agony, and so painful was her condition that her attendance at the chapel to hear what termed the condemned sermon was not enforced. The reverend chaplain, with much feeling, endeavoured to induce the unhappy culprit to make a full confession of her guilt. She declined, making the least admission, merely remarking that God above knows all. During the day, she had a parting interview with her husband. Sometimes she was kissing him, and then sitting on his knee and weeping over him, although the scene is described to have been most affecting. As early as five o'clock in the morning, the Reverend Ordinary was with the wretched woman. For nearly two hours, he continued with her in deep prayer. He failed in eliciting from her any statement that could be termed an acknowledgement of her guilt. As the hour of her doom approached, her sufferings became evidently more severe. Shortly after eight o'clock, Mr. Jessop, the under-sheriff, arrived and saw that the usual arrangements were complete for the awful ceremony. A few minutes before nine o'clock, the governor and the other officers appeared in her cell and conducted her towards the drop. During the process of pinioning her arms, her strength seemed to fail, and it was only by the support of two or three of the warders that she could be got onto the scaffold. In her progress, she frequently ejaculated, Lord, save me, save me, and on being placed under the fateful beam, she, in a faltering voice, said, May the Lord have mercy on my soul. The executioner, Calcraft, then adjusted the rope, and the miserable creature could not have been on the drop scarcely a minute ere she was launched into eternity. Apparently, life was extinct in a few seconds. In the course of an hour, four or five of the warders with the executioner appeared on the drop to take down the body, which seemed to be done in a rather bungling manner. On the corpse being lowered, a kind of black crepe cap, which no doubt had been worn by the culprit, came blowing over from the scaffold. It was captured by a little boy who put it into his pocket and ran towards the town, with a crowd of other boys running after him, demanding a sight of it. We mention the circumstances as two or three of the warders saw the flight of the cap and made no attempt to regain it. In fact, one of them laughed at the chase of the boys after the prize. Although the rain was falling the whole time, a large concourse of persons assembled to witness the proceedings. The larger portion consisted of females and boys and girls many of the women having children in their arms. The wretched culprit was 38 years of age. She had been married twice, and it is said had had as many as 16 children, most of them being dead. It is 10 years since an execution took place in Chelmsford, and the last woman executed in the county was about 48 years ago. The undersheriff informed the reporter that the convict had maintained her silence as to her guilt on the scaffold, and that she had left the world without making the least confession. So ended the life of Mary May, who to the last pleaded innocence. However, it was now remembered that her previous husband had died in a similar way as her brother, violently within a 30-hour period. Also, 14 of her children, all dying with a short 30-hour window, violently. And then it was found that similar deaths were occurring to husbands and children of close friends of Mary. With so many deaths rapidly unfolding, 
all tied to Mary May, it was difficult for the authorities to keep up and decisions had to be made as to which cases to pursue. From the Clonmel Chronicle on the 5th of September, 1848, Discovery of More Horrible Murders by Poisoning Another most atrocious murder by secret poisoning has, within the last two or three days, been discovered in the neighbourhood of Wicks, connected with which are some unpleasant statements, implicating one or more females with other murders, which have led to the most painful excitement throughout this part of the country. The particulars, as far as we have been able to collect them, show that the wretched woman, Mary May, who was executed at Chelmsford Jail on Monday week for the murder of her brother for his burial fees, urged and advised the commission of the dreadful crimes, one of which, at least, had been clearly established. Some surprise had been manifested at the course the authorities adopted in not investigating the other charges of murder in which Mary May was said to be implicated, and a general opinion is held amongst the police that she not only disposed of her former husband by the same horrible means, but also several of her children. She had sixteen children. Thirteen of the fourteen children died suddenly. Nothing appears to have been done, however, in the matter until Wednesday when Mr. Raisin, inspector of the constabulary stationed in the district, received a warrant from Mr. Codd, one of the coroners for the county, directing the disinterment of Thomas Ham, then lying in the burial ground of Tendering Church in the vicinity of Wick. This party was the husband of a sister of Mary May, whose death took place in April last year. He appears to have been a steady, industrious man, and had accumulated a little money. His wife, however, was not so frugal, being rather irregular in her conduct. Ham quarrelled about a man named Southgate, and soon afterwards he was suddenly attacked with sickness and died in a few hours. There was no inquest held, and his death, like the other suspected cases, being registered as from natural causes. His remains were interred in Tendering Church and exhumed, as before stated, on Wednesday. A coroner's jury was impanelled on the same day, and Messrs. Manthorpe and Son were directed to secure the stomach for analysis by Professor Taylor, who is an eminent lecturer on chemistry at Guy's Hospital. Today, the authorities received information from Mr. Taylor to the effect that he had found sufficient arsenic in the intestines to account for death. In consequence of that discovery, the suspected party had been arrested and awaits the close of the coroner's inquiry. The police have also received instructions to exhume other remains. From here, Mary's sister, Hannah Southgate, with whom she was very close, is charged for the murder of her husband, Thomas Ham. Hannah, whilst married to her husband, Thomas Ham, had been carrying on an affair with Southgate. They married very shortly after the surprise death of her husband, Thomas Harm. From the Court Examiner on the 8th of September, 1848, The Poisoning in Essex A verdict of willful murder has been returned against Hannah Southgate, charged at Thorpe with poisoning her first husband, Thomas Ham. It will be remembered that the accused was an intimate friend of Mary May, recently executed for murder, and the suspicion is that the two women were engaged in more than one of the poisoning cases 
which have disgraced this county. The verdict was delivered late last evening, and upon hearing it, the prisoner exclaimed, I am innocent, gentlemen, of the crime, and exhibited great composure. She was immediately removed and conveyed by train to Chelmsford County Jail. The inquiry did not terminate till 0900. It was said that application will be made to the Secretary of State to authorise further examination of bodies of parties suspected to have been poisoned in the neighbourhoods of Dovercourt, Bradfield, Tendering and Ramsey. From the convictions of Mary May and her sister Hannah Southgate, she also had five or six children die in similar circumstances as the death of her brother. Attempts are made to discover just how many deaths Mary was responsible for and had the authorities stumbled upon a poisoning ring. Was any man or child safe who had had any proximity to Mary May, even indirectly. More police investigations ensue, with mysterious deaths having occurred with Mary May's circle of friends. The husband of her sister, Hannah Southgate, died suspiciously. The husband of a Mrs. Burton, who was in intimate terms of friendship with Mary, died suspiciously. The husband of Mrs. Palmer, another friend of Mary May's, dies suspiciously. The husband of a Mrs. Brudger, another good friend of Mary, dies abruptly. And five or six children of Mrs. Reed, also she was a good friend of Mary's, died abruptly. All died violently within a 30-hour period. All had been in good health previously. From the Times, the 15th of September, 1848. The late poisoning in Essex, discovery of more atrocious murders. A searching investigation has been set on foot by the authorities during the last few days amongst the inhabitants of Thorpe, Kirby, Ramsey, Wicks, Mistley, Bradford, and Great Oakley and places adjacent. In consequence of the suspicions which have been raised that the system of poisoning has been carried out to a much larger extent than originally supposed. There is every reason to fear, judging from the circumstances which have transpired, that the husbands and children of a great number of women who were on the habits of intimacy with Mrs. May and Mrs. Southgate have been destroyed. The case to which the authorities are now principally directing their attention is that of a person named Nathaniel Button, formerly a resident in the parish of Ramsey, who died in September 1846, a few days after the death of Mrs. May's husband. It was ascertained that Mrs. Button was on intimate terms of friendship with Mrs. May and Mrs. Southgate. From the evidence it appears that Button was well until the day before his death. He was seized with sudden illness after partaking of some food which had been prepared for him by his wife, and died in a few hours. The next case under investigation is that of a person named Palmer, resident in Ramsey, who died shortly after Button, under somewhat similar circumstances. He had been at work until the day before his death, and up to that time had been in perfect health. After partaking of some food which was cooked by his wife, he became sick. He retired to bed and within a few hours died in frightful agony. The case of Phoebe Reed, one of the witnesses against Mrs. Southgate, is also under investigation. Reed deposed that Mrs. Ham, or Southgate, had had six children, but that only one of them was then alive. Mrs. Southgate then pointedly asked Reed how many children she had had 
Reed admitted that she had had five, all illegitimate, but that only one of them had lived. From the fact that none of the children had been ill more than a day or thirty hours at the most, the whole of these bodies are to be disinterred. Mrs. Southgate's children, six in number, in the language of the neighbours, dropped off short and were supposed to have been white-powdered, poisoned by arsenic. These cases are likewise undergoing inquiry. The town of Great Holland in the Tendering Union has also, it is suspected, been the scene of one, if not more, of these poisonings. A man named Brudger died some time since, suddenly and in great agony, having been well and, and at his work until a few hours before his death. In consequence of the discoveries made respecting Mrs. May and Mrs. Southgate, with both of whom Mrs. Brudger was intimate, the body of the husband and those of his children are to be exhumed for the purpose of having the contents of their stomachs analysed. Two other cases are under consideration, one in the parish of Tendering and the other in the parish of Bradfield. In the investigations of these cases, it has been ascertained that most, if not all, owe their origin to the existence of what are, in this part of the country, called death clubs. These clubs are chiefly composed of the class of persons to whom which those alluded to belong, and the manner in which the businesses is managed may be thus described. A person, a man or a woman, enters one of these clubs agreeing to pay a sum of sevenpence a quarter and at the same time appointing a nominee at whose death the subscribing party receives ten or nine or eight pounds. Mrs. Southgate was a member of one of these clubs. Mrs. Button was also a member and received eight pounds on the death of her husband. The death clubs seem to have been productive of the most disastrous consequences and to have held out a premium to murder which would now not have otherwise existed. A clue has been obtained to several other cases, but at present it would not be prudent to make any remarks upon them. They will undergo the fullest investigation with the least possible delay. The government spent the next five years trying to track down the many deaths by arsenic. Anyone who had been friends of Mary and her sister Hannah, and who had had the misfortune of death in the family, was suspect. This was considered further suspect when it was found that the dead relative had been placed in a death club. Government officials believe that they had uncovered a death club ring of poisoners. And it all started with Mary May. That concludes this Serial Killer Saturday episode of Mary May, Death Club Killer Mastermind. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We're aiming for 1,000 subscribers. If you have already subscribed, our sincere thanks for your support. We very much appreciate it. We upload five times a week, Wednesdays, Whitechapel Wednesdays, where we chronologically go through the newspaper stories related in Whitechapel leading to the series of gruesome crimes in 1888 and arguably beyond. Thursdays, an in-depth investigation into a famous story of its day. Fridays, we present a pooled-together collection of stories from our database, for example, Murders on Railways. Saturdays are our Serial Killer Saturdays, and we review one of the historical serial killers in our large database. And Sundays, a new series we are trialling, Eccentric Sundays where we look into Great Britain's rich history of quirky, odd and eccentric characters. 
For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.